It's April 6th in Miami, and it's been a long time, Ed Thigpen, since uh, New York in the 1950s. It is good to see you again. I was just out there in the 1950 decade watching you perform in various venues, and I want to ask you, I'm always curious about one thing, and that is, if I mention the name Zooty Singleton to you, what do you say? I say, uh, what I say? I just say a great, a fantastic drummer, fantastic man. And, I, you know, I was trying to think of a piece that he played, um, Stardust. He played the ballad, ballad solo on snare drum, playing Stardust with a press roll, you know, with the accents. No, I, he was a great drummer, a great person. Let's talk about him as a person. What did you admire about him? Well, when I say as a person, I, you know, I didn't know him well, you know, to be hanging out. But he was always very kind to me, you know, along with the, he was one of my father's peers, you know. And um, all of those people in that era, they were just always very kind people to young guys starting out, you know, always had time for you. What did you learn from him, by observation or well, osmosis? I didn't see him that much. You know, Zooty Singleton and I caught in bits and pieces. Like I said before, I heard Stardust, and that was uh, what impressed me. It was later years after I was, you know, because my influences were not in that area. Where were your influences? Well, I guess uh, I would say my father, for one, you know, Ben Thigpen, who was with Andy Kirk's band for so long. Uh, Good night. Um, early influences would be uh, Gene Krupa, of course, was an influence. I mean, I saw all the movies. I bought the bracelet because they said it made your left hand stronger, you know. Uh, he was a great showman. There was another man, which I don't know, you probably never heard of him, was C.P. Johnson. He used to have a lot of tom-toms and have a chorus line. This is out in California, you know, playing, and I enjoyed that. And... Uh, who else? Uh, would Joe, and then when I saw Joe Jones, that did it for me. And uh, he became like my mentor, really, Joe Jones. Your observations of Joe Jones uh, and his strategies and techniques? Well, I could just say that he's um, this total. He's like a symphony. I've, you know, it's uh, just total music, uh, picturesque, everything. He just encompassed everything as a person and as a, um, he had a big heart. He was very open. He gave a lot, continues to do so. His door was always open to all of us to come in. And uh, it wasn't so much as far as showing uh, technically what to do. I think he may have shown me about two or three times this is out of the years, you know, just sit down and say, it's this way. But mostly it was through um, his philosophy and talking, he could make you feel like you could walk out and conquer the world, you know. And his wisdom, you know, life wisdom, so, th so you could express yourself through the instrument, things like that, or just being around him. Then it was my father, and then Chico Hamilton was a help, and then later, of course, it's all the, all the people, all the innovators, Max Roach, after I heard him, I was turned on, you know, and Art Blakey, all the great players, all of them, all of them have been influences and continue to be so. People you ne never hear of, you know, if they're good, I'm influenced. <laughs> You're living uh, mostly out of Copenhagen, and that's uh, like Art Farmer living in Vienna, a totally different environment from the environment you knew and when you grew up uh, what um, what uh, what about the European influence and uh, that whole performance area uh, as a life learning experience against your professional it helped me grow up <laughs> you know because I was caught in a place where I'm in a country that I don't you know it's a language difference for me um, to be honest with you, when I moved over to Europe, I, I had a very good job. I was working with Ella Fitzgerald, but I fell in love with a Danish lady, and she didn't want to live over here, and she gave me some, a beautiful child, and I, my telephone bill got so big, I said, well, I go to Europe and stay. 
and my income dropped four fifths, so it was like starting over again, right? But best I can tell you is helped me to learn, you know, get my priorities in order because it's so different, you know. I grabbed the microphone just to insert. Art Farmer uh, restated the same thing just the other day. He said, "Living in Vienna helped me get my priorities in order is that too." Right? Well, and there's a bit of uh, osmosis and uh, extrasensory yeah. communication. Well, I guess we, I think well, a lot of us feel that way, you know, because it is entirely different. The, it's unique, it has its, you know, it's, this country's very new, you know, in the big scheme of things as far as history is concerned. There, the Europeans have their traditions, you know, it just goes back eons, you know, so it's an old civilization uh, being exposed to, you know, within a matter of almost minutes to speak completely different cultural backgrounds and changes, you know. Ed Thigpen, when you got your priorities ordered out, what, would you identify them and what were they? Well, I mean, <laughs> I guess they, they, uh, the same ones I had when I was seven years old, it just took me to go all the way around the world to get them together. You know, to, I mean, where there became a reality, you know, like, um, it was little things, you know, things like, uh, things in this country that we take for granted, uh, things, I mentioned things, it's uh, from the standpoint of uh, material things, you know, uh, things we take for granted here, you know, like getting an apartment and uh, finding out that if you... Uh, walk into an apartment in Copenhagen, if you get one, that you have to, if you want to hang your clothes up, you know, you have to buy a closet, you know, there's no closet, you have, you have four walls, you know, no utilities, no nothing, you know, like, pap, that's it. Uh, I, when I left Los Angeles, I had a very lovely home and some property and couple of cars and a studio out in the back, right? The telephone in the yard. And now, after starting all over again, there I'm, my dream is to have a little studio again that has hot water and an inside toilet, you know, like things like, like, things like that, you know. But it doesn't matter. I mean, sometimes there's some of the things that it's like you learn to find out that some things aren't really necessary in order to live, you know, and uh, the other is that uh, I learned to manage my money like I live to do, you know, I, I can live on equally as well on maybe two-thirds the amount because I've learned to deal with it, you know, you know, so it's... Uh, you know, things like that. Just life's experiences, how you deal with life. Now to the musical priorities. Yeah. Do anything for the discipline? Uh, perseverance. I mean, thank God I'm, and I am, and I have the background that I have, right? And, um, and I come and have my heritage as a black American musician or person that all of these things have uh, been an asset to my survival in Europe. Had I not had my background, they would have buried me, to be honest, you know? They would have, I mean, I mean, it takes a certain amount of strength. And so since I have the background, which goes into my heritage here, and the experiences that I had had, I was able to overcome certain obstacles that I had you know, and that would be from um, from childhood, you know, my the religious background, or the, the faith that we had, what we were taught, uh, the um, uh, so-called hindrances that I never really had here, but we say we are faced with ethnically, you know, so certain things don't bother you, you're not hung up with that, and uh, I didn't have the problem. I never have had that problem, but uh, being able to deal with Europeans as people, you know, and be able to more or less 
psych in that you find out that the people are nationalistic, you know, which is okay, you know. I mean, you just deal with it and then you find out about yourself. And as a player, you know, like I said, they would have buried me hadn't I known better, you know, because I didn't have the work. But I, there was somebody who cared, maybe in another place. So again, you relate to that. As long as somebody cares about what you're doing, you go with that, you know. So it's... Um, the musical environment for you, stimulating? Very. And the last, uh, as a matter of fact, in many ways, it's um, been a great growth period for me, uh, musically, because I've taken the time. I've had the opportunity to... Um, I keep a studio, even with no hot water, I keep a studio. <laughs> so I can practice. So I've worked very hard in trying to develop my, you know, my craft, huh? And uh, I've had opportunity in the last five years to play with everybody. I mean, everybody comes through Copenhagen. So, I mean, in one given summer, four-month period, a five-month period, I may play with Mill Jackson, Benny Carter, Teddy Wilson, Dorothy Donegan, uh, you know, just loads of different people. I mean, all, but all winners, all great artists. And in Copenhagen now, <clears throat> in the last four years, five years, we have quite a community there. Uh, people like Thad Jones, I worked with his orchestra and I've had the opportunity to be, we've become like family in a sense, really, be under his and learning experience from great, I mean, he's our greatest jazz composer. So being with people like that, now I work with Ernie Wilkins' almost big band, they call it, which gives me a chance to do with the big bands. I work with Kenny Drew and Niels Henning, right? on a regular basis and so and we have some good bass players there and there are a lot of fine musicians so it's all plus meantime uh, the influence of all these Americans uh, on the uh, Danish scene and all of Scandinavia what uh, how can you describe what your influence is and what Kenny Drew and what uh, Ernie Wilkins and Thad Jones influences are on Danish or just generally Scandinavian and Finnish musicians. Is there something happening there? Well, <clears throat> you know, jazz is now universal. You can't say you have some good players over there, but it is, in my opinion, it is still, as I coined the phrase, American classical music. We can, one of the reasons I've I'm involved in educational projects back here now, as well as over there. And I'm very encouraged to see the youth now really interested in their heritage, which is what I come from, right? And, um, and as far as our influence over there, well, it didn't start with me. You had, uh, oh, good God, you know, you had great jazz players over all through England, great players, you know, and then, uh, gee, man, what? from the time of the First World War, you've had musicians going over, so the Europeans are not ignorant as far as jazz are concerned by any stretch of the imagination. You have great players over there. As a matter of fact, they're probably more knowledgeable, per se, than the average Americans are. You know, I mean, because they aren't uh, fickle about it. They have their own culture, so they're not, it's nothing, this, they accept our 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 music as an art form, I would put it that way. Ed Thigpen, you come from a beautiful tradition. Your father uh, allied with Andy Kirk and his Clouds of Joy, Mary Lou Williams, Dick Wilson, and uh, those fine players out of Kansas City. And that's the American heritage on one side. Uh, as you were growing up, what uh, what did you uh, uh, feel and sense as you were growing uh, in in this environment? Well, I felt uh, first. I felt uh, well. You know, as I said before, and uh, when I grew up, we had the church, right? Yes. And we used to sing, Jesus loves me, yes I know, you know. And I took it literally, literally and I believe it very strongly. So we had our faith. Uh, we learned to be kind, to be forgiving, you know. 
and to feel that all mankind, we're all God's children, <clears throat> regardless of our mistakes and so forth. So we have to look at it from that standpoint. Okay, that's first and prime, you know, first and foremost. Uh, from the standpoint of what we're dealing with, I liked everything. I listened to, I took, um, took it literally. There was may have been propaganda, but I took it literally. I mean, the Constitution and and the Boy Scouts and helping people, all these nice things. I, I believed in all that, you know. So I went for it, and I still. I'm glad I did because it was a nice way to grow up. I mean, you had the realities. Now I wasn't brought up in an area where it was really heavy, you know, as far as the uh, deep south. My mother got me out of that. You know, I was brought up in California. I mean, you had it, but uh, I don't know. We, I, I've been very fortunate in my life. I've always seen that, uh, been able to be around <clears throat> people of all types who um, some are a drag and some are just wonderful. So it wasn't a matter of, um, and then also my family heritage. You know, I, uh, it was hard for me to rationalize hatred. It made me sick. It was a waste. You know, so that kind of thing. And it carries over into the music, you know, people that you deal with. So it's basically it's loving and trying to be, that's all. And whatever talents you have, you try to hone them and just, you know, take a part in living and do your best, that's all. Did you get to hear the Andy Kirk band very often? Quite. I, you know, I mean, that, that was, they had me there when I was, you know, I guess my father says when I was in my mother's womb, there was there, you know, I was just like growing up with it. And then as a kid, even though it was the depression, uh, we had a lot of music in the neighborhood, you know, and uh, in the school and dance lessons and everything. And so when the band came around, I was around. So I was just surrounded all the time. What impressed you about the Andy Kirk band in in composition, arrangement, and performance? Oh no, no, that you know when I, I, I what made me want to become a musician really was the fact, to be honest with you, was that I went to when I would go to the show and I'd see the you know the curtain opens up and this chorus line comes out and all this joy and happiness and show business, just show business. I wanted to be part of something that helped to make people happy. I enjoyed it, and I just liked that. Ed Thigpen, thank you ever so much. I have a postscript here. Dexter Gordon and uh, the, the Finnish and Scandinavian uh, performances. Um, anything uh, there where you crossed paths in the... Dexter. Oh yeah, I've worked with Dexter, you know, and then when he got hot again over here, he moved back, you know. Well, not a lot, but I, I played with him, you know, quite a bit in the Momacho, but then he... You know, like I said, he got hot again over here, so he moved. <laughs> and I'll probably do the same thing. <laughs> Come back home. <laughs> Ed, thanks ever so much. It's a pleasure talking to you after hours on this April 6th in the year 1985. Some 30 years with water over the dam. That's all right. Still good. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>